Thanks, Molly, for, for the introduction. Um, very warm welcome for everyone who's joining us for our, for our webinar, especially for those who are joining us for the very first time um, to one of the Bipolar UK webinars. Uh, my name's Simon Kitchen. I'm the, the Chief Exec of Bipolar UK. I've been Chief Exec for just over five years. And in that time, one of my big passions for the charity has been its role in re dramatically reducing the risk of suicide for people um, living with bipolar. Um, so I myself, I'm not living with bipolar. Um, but I've had um, connections of it in my family. Um, so my brother-in-law, Kevin, uh, was living with bipolar and unfortunately took his own life because of the condition. And absolutely everything that could have gone wrong in his care pretty much went wrong. And that gives me a real passion for the work that, that I do for the charity. Um, he was basically someone who had a very bright career. He, was, he worked at 15 uh, with Jamie Oliver, um, was a really good chef. Struggled from his physical health, went to university, then retrained going to university, but had a very severe episode of, of I think it was mania, ended up being sectioned. They just had a really horrendous experience from uh, from being sectioned. Came out of hospital, the didn't really talk, wasn't really talked to with the family around him having bipolar, what that meant, about the increased risk of suicide. Um, and unfortunately he he um he took his own life. And um, left a huge scar on the family and um, we're still living with that legacy today um, in so many different respects and it's, it's well over 10 years since um, Kevin left us. Um, so it, it gives us a bit of a um, quite a quite a tragic start but I think I hope all of you will finish today with a message of hope because the problem's really difficult but there's loads of things that we can do to fix it and we I don't think there's an area where you could probably do more to save lives than reducing the risk of suicide for people living with bipolar. And we're going to hear some amazing speakers here today who are going to be talking about their challenges from different perspectives in terms of um, how they've experienced suicidal thoughts, how they dealt with them, but also how they've actually supported and saved the lives of people experiencing acute suicidal thoughts um, from the emergency services as well. So if everyone who's joining us here today will come away with some really practical advice on how to keep people safe during these periods and, uh, and also some hope that there's no inevitability to this, that every single life that's lost to, to a bipolar suicide, we hope um, in time we'll be able to, to be able to save them. So what is the risk around bipolar and suicide? Well, um, unfortunately, there's a very close correlation. People with bipolar, were, those of you who have kind of done work of the charity over the last few years will be familiar with our mood scale. We kind of charts people's experience from, from the high moods of mania to the very low moods of depression. And recurring suicidal thoughts is, is, is one of the most common experiences that people with bipolar have. So um, it's reported by about 90% of people living with bipolar. So it's really acute, and that's quite significantly higher than the, the population itself. And a large proportion of people living with bipolar will also attempt suicide. That's what they that's what the um meet. I think it's almost about 50% or thereabouts. So that's absolutely astonishingly high number. Um one of the there's always kind of a fatalism around suicide and a lot of people living with bipolar will kind of read those stats and hear them and think, well, this, this is this is really difficult. It's completely stacked against me. But this is particularly the risk for people who are undiagnosed. So if you're watching this right now and you're living with bipolar, you've already reduced your risk of, of um, suicide ideation um, and suicidal thoughts and, um, and the risk of suicide attempts. So being with us now is actually a real positive step forward. And there's a lot of the devastating stats are around people who are undiagnosed. So we found that... Um, it's a we we'd like to consider bipolar suicide as a bit like the same way that someone would, would have a, a really acute physical condition. So if you're living with um, diabetes, people who are diabetic will have a diabetic shock, um, in, which is life threatening. Um, if you've got a heart cardiovascular disease, you might have a heart attack. And suicidal thoughts, acute suicidal thoughts, are exactly the same. People with bipolar, they're thoughts that can usually pass, but they are like an emergency situation. So that's really important that we're. That we're going to be hearing from from Ash later on in this talk, um, but also there's things that you can do to be able to reduce that risk of suicide as well, which we're going to hear from from Melanie as well. So, in the in terms of the, the raw numbers on this, they've they've just reduced produced the national strategy on suicide prevention. A lot of it's data based, which is good, but one of the big problems that we've got is that people with bipolar only half of them are actually diagnosed. So that's a real challenge for us because it's. Bipolar is really invisible within the healthcare system. Even when people have a diagnosis, they often get lost within the system. Um, but we do know that of those that do have a diagnosis, it accounts for at least 5% of all suicides in the UK. So 
Um, that's an actually class number, and that's, that comes from um, a study that was looking at autism. So they did a psych, um, it's called a psychological autism, uh, autist uh, autopsy, which is where they went through the coroner's reports of about 340 people. Coroner asked to investigate every single suicide, and they did a, um, they looked at the, the diagnosis that the people had, and then they did follow up interviews with a number of people just to see if people might have had undiagnosed autism. Um, the kind of initial study that they did, just looking at the records, found that over 5% of all the, the records had a suicide, had a bipolar diagnosis. So that's a huge number. And if you think that by, uh, only half people with bipolar have actually got a diagnosis, then that's well over, uh, it's probably likely to be closer to 12% of all suicides in the UK. So that's a that's a really astonishing stat. It should be really front and centre of every single suicide prevention plan. Um, diagnosis itself is a is a massive risk for people. We we really do a lot of work on diagnosis. That's because the community tells us it's important. Um, as I said, less than half the people have a diagnosis. It can take 9.5 years on average. And the longer people wait, they tell us that the, the, the higher the risk that they attempted suicide as well. So um, those who are waiting not to two years reported um, that 24% of them said that they, they attempted suicide because of the delay. So not just attempted suicide, but because of the delay, compared to 39% that, were, that had to wait between five and 10 years. So I think it's really critical to be able to get that diagnosis delay down from um, certainly well down to around 5%, about five years. I do want to get it down to a matter of months like it is for other serious mental illnesses. But um, we've, we've got a big call out at the moment to get all the, the political parties ahead of the general election to make a commitment to get it down to five years within the next five years. Um, undiagnosed bipolar, yeah, dramatically increases the risk. We Some studies from America suggest that um, having um, undiagnosed bipolar, that, um, that up to 20% of all people with undiagnosed bipolar will eventually die by suicide. I mean, that is an absolutely horrendous stat. 20%, it's like one in five. So um, that is something that needs urgent action. I can't imagine there's any group in society which has a higher risk of suicide than, than people living with bipolar. Um, so that's um, so that's something that we really um, we really need to take concerted action on. Obviously, a big part of that is the failures in the healthcare system. So we know a lot of people being sectioned, a lot of people dealing with trauma as part of that experience. I think almost one in five people going to hospital under section are taking a police car, so they're dealing with a huge amount of trauma there as well. And we're going to come on to hearing from Ash that actually the police do have a very positive role often in suicide prevention as well. So to be able to, 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 to fix suicide, we need to take a whole system approach. We need to look at it in terms of identifying people living with bipolar, give them a diagnosis, um, get them onto treatment so they're able to reduce their risk. There's very effective treatments out there like lithium that have a massive impact, can really help. Um, if you're lucky enough to benefit from lithium, then that's something that could be um, that, that can reduce your risk of suicide. Um, and then also all the things we're going to be talking about with Eleanor as well around suicide prevention plans. So getting people a diagnosis, getting them on proper treatment, getting the proper support as well to deal with some of the underlying issues that might be driving some of those suicidal thoughts. Um, and then we passionately believe that everyone with bipolar can lead a really full and amazing life, which I think is the goal that we we really aspire to. So I'm going to hand it over to Eleanor now, who's going to share about it from a from a family perspective. Hi, Eleanor. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, I kind of think with these things, where do I begin? So firstly, I just want to say I will be talking about um, my dad's experiences as well. And he's actually here today. He's watching. So hi, dad. Um, <laughs> um, so our family story with bipolar, um, or mine started at 15. I was diagnosed at 16 with bipolar one disorder, uh, which means that I have acute mania and acute depressive episodes when I'm unwell. And just four years before me, my dad was um, diagnosed with bipolar, but his was a more sort of typical story, as you described, Simon. He had 9.5 years undiagnosed, uh, where he experienced suicidal thoughts and no one thought to send him to a psychiatrist. This was the 1990s, where obviously it was less known about or less kind of spotted. And my dad spent many, many years battling suicidal thoughts and thinking to himself, you know, he had young children and a wife and that was what stopped him from acting on those at the time. And then he luckily got a diagnosis and was put on lithium treatment and has been well pretty much for 20 years. He's responded really, really well. And then, um, which is great. Um, and then just four years after my dad was diagnosed in 2004, I was diagnosed when I was a teenager with bipolar. 
um, which was a big shock to the system, as you can imagine, um, being such so young and being told you've got this sort of um, not terminal illness, but you've got a chronic illness that will last your entire life. And um, I initially wasn't put on lithium treatment because I was too young. So I was put on a mood stabilizer medication to balance my moods out and antidepressants. And that held me for about 10 years. Um, and I was able to go to university, do all the things that, you know, people have said, you can't do that because you're bipolar. Why would, you know, you can't go to university. You can't have a fulfilling life. Um, and I was like, actually, I can and I want to and I, I'm going to try. So with the support of my family, got there. But in um 2013 I experienced a very bad depression uh where I had thoughts of taking my own life which were intrusive and were horrible um and luckily I recognized them I knew they, they frightened me so much that I went to my family and said this is what's happening we've got to do something because I haven't experienced this for a really long time and luckily um so my family, some of them are medical, and my dad obviously knew what was going on. So they were there to support me. We went back to my psychiatrist and um, had somewhat of a treatment plan. But then the my meds basically stopped working at that point. And then I became very unwell with mania and ended up being sectioned as well in hospital. Um in 2014 so I was in hospital for four months followed by a day hospital and at that point the doctor said Eleanor you should really go on to lithium because it's helped your dad um it's helped you know this is you don't want to be living like this and I just said you know what I'll give it a try I was really scared because I knew of the, the side effects and, and other things uh but put onto lithium worked for me um had a lot of trauma as you say when you are sectioned in hospital and you're feeling very low you know there is a lot of trauma um around that um but had a lot of therapy and in time kind of found a semblance of recovery um with the lithium treatment and with self-management and self-care um so one of the things that I think is really important is that you comply with medication as much as you can that doctors are giving you although if obviously um you're not happy with it go back to a psychiatrist and tweak that um I always make sure to get enough sleep to take my medicine regime on time um at the right time um on my medications to drink enough um water and eat enough salt because obviously lithium is quite a powerful drug um and you have to look after yourself so that you know the physical side effects um but also things like avoiding alcohol and drugs I've I've never really drunk because I don't know what the impact would be on me and my moods and my medicine and whatever um I drink just a little bit um I'm just going to look to my notes to see if I missed anything about self-management so when I came out of hospice I worked with somebody on a like a um crisis prevention plan so some of you watching may have done that yourselves it's where you put down um all the things, you know, if you've had suicidal thinking or you've self-harm or anything like that, you can create a plan to avert a crisis. For example, um, you'd write down sort of things that will um, stop you from engaging in negative behaviours or things that, you know, engaging in self-harm and stuff like that. So I worked with somebody on that, which was very, very helpful. Um, just having to think what else. Um the main thing I think that has helped me to stay well as well as lithium treatment and therapy has been having the support of family. So if you don't have that support, it can be a lot harder. And I think if you, especially if you're feeling suicidal and think you have thoughts of taking your own life as well. Um, I think, you know, as, as you said, Simon, with your own family background as well, and your, was it your brother-in-law lost his life 10 years ago? So I was sectioned 10 years ago and I, I can see how if I didn't have the support of my family and I was just advocating for myself, how difficult that could have been, you know? And so thank you for sharing that. Um, So I think that is pretty much everything. Let's have a read. Yeah, I guess daily self-management is just checking in with yourself, seeing how you are. Sometimes I speak to my my family and I say, you know, do you think I'm a bit high today or am I a bit low? Because because I've got pretty good at kind of realising because I don't have frequent episodes, um, which is good. Um, so, yeah, I would just say, you know, um, just kind of reach for that support. Make sure, you you know, if you really think you have the illness as well and you're, you're not diagnosed, get the diagnosis because that 
help me a lot. Um, and yeah, just comply with treatment as best as you can and just keep going because I think the most important thing to know is that there is hope and there is a future. Um, it doesn't have to be awful all the time. So hope that's helpful. Um, and if you put it into a recovery action plan, and um, because many people put a lot of these kind of tips and advice into a into a plan to keep themselves well, and it's quite a very um sensible thing to do, even if you're probably a very wise thing to do when you're when you're well, because bipolar is a fluctuating condition. So you kind of plan plan for the worst and and hope for the best. So did you did you record any of those into like a called wraps, aren't they? Recovery action plans or suicide prevention plan. Yeah, I am. Um, when I came out of hospital in 2014, I worked with a psychologist and we basically um, wrote down all kind of like the triggers and things, you know, a plan as to what could happen. Um, you know, if if I was feeling at crisis, what should happen? Luckily, I never had to use it so much. Um, but it was good to sort of refer to and, and to think of in times if I do get ill in the future, you know, what 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 how can people help me how can you know the psychologist help me how can my family help me who are the key people and if I have to go into hospital again things like um you know how do I want to be treated because being sectioned and being in hospital sometimes as you said causes a lot of trauma and you get treated in ways that you aren't so happy with sometimes as well so um it's good to have that plan because then you can advocate for yourself as well yeah and what do you do? So I'm just seeing um, Daniel's coming. In. Daniel, can you hear me a little bit better now? Is that is that a bit better? Um, what do you plan? How, I don't know, how do you keep yourself safe? What are your plans to keep yourself safe if uh, the worst happened and you experience really deep recurring suicidal thoughts, like the, that specific moment? Because it's obviously a key part of it, as you've said there, is about planning to keep yourself well, isn't it? It's effective self-management. And thanks, Molly, for just posting up the mood scale there. Because what... what what we're really passionate about as a charity is everyone's using the mood scale when people start to dip, their mood starts to dip slightly or they start to get slightly high. It's giving them techniques and approaches to to bring them back to a, to a balanced mood, which is in the technicals euphemia. But people do um, do experience really acute suicidal thoughts, same way that someone's like having a heart attack or a diabetic shock. Like it's, it's not their fault. There's things you can do to reduce your risk for it, but those feelings come you've got to keep yourself safe, haven't you? So is there anything, any advice you could give people on that, in that respect? On keeping themselves safe? Um, I'd say that I am lucky in the, in the respect that my medicine stops my suicidal thoughts at the moment. Um, I've been really well for a long time, but when I was experiencing those thoughts, in order to keep yourself safe, I think there's a few things. I think tell a trusted person around you, so a friend, a family member, um, GP, um, if you don't have that support network, um, that you are feeling that way. Um, and because my family, for example, when I told them that I was feeling um, like I wanted to take my own life, they made sure that my home environment was safe for me. They made sure that I got, you know, I, I went to the doctor and spoke about it and and got treatment in that sense um, because I was really, really unwell. Um, and... So I think if you're having recurring suicidal thoughts and they're not going away and they're not controlled by, you know, medicine or treatment, it's, it can be very, very challenging. And I would just say, if you have the capacity to keep yourself safe, brilliant. But if not, maybe tell a trusted friend or a helpline and they can kind of advise you as to how you can keep yourself, you know, make sure your home environment is safe so that you don't have things around you um, that could could make things worse or you know speak about how you're feeling and um, if you have a therapist go to a therapist that kind of thing I think is helpful oh no, that's that's brilliant thank you lots of really great um techniques and advice there. And, and all of our services are available for people as well so we've been using use our e-community um that's uh, available 24 7 it's really important that that is actually moderated as well because one of the tragedies about my brother-in-law's experience was he was on um, unmoderated Facebook groups and they were actually really kind of were very harmful for him um, but actually our e-community is a safe space it's, it's moderated so um, if people become unwell we do reach out to them it's not a crisis service but we do reach out to people in crisis to, to support them to stay well um, and our, our callback service if someone is experiencing um, they think that they want to get a plan in place for how they can reduce their suicidal thoughts and certainly uh, we can help with some signposting some, to some really good charities as well who we work alongside 
Thanks for that, Anna. And Ash, so we've used the analogy about comparing suicidal thoughts to physical conditions, because that's a very, people are very, very familiar with the idea that if you're having a heart attack, you call 999, in the same way that people don't have that same attitude towards um, the police if, or calling 999 if they're actually experiencing suicidal thoughts, even though they're just as deadly and can be ju just as dangerous. So, um, Ash, just want to introduce yourself. You're, you're a policeman and you're one of the first responders who actually takes those calls when someone um, expresses um, suicidal thoughts. So could you just run through, Ash, what the police's role is? So there's a couple of questions coming up, uh, particularly interested because of the, the, the changes in the police procedure on this. But um, certainly the, at the moment, what the police do to help people if they're experiencing suicidal thoughts? Yeah, thank you, um, Simon. Yes, yeah, so my name is uh, my name is Ash. I run a, a hostage and crisis negotiation unit in Mid Wales, um, and we deal with all manner of incidents. But primarily, I'd say over eighty percent of ours are uh, crisis intervention or suicide prevention calls. Uh, we've got nationwide coverage. There's ordinarily each force has got a coordinator and two negotiators readily available, twenty four hours a day, but can call on more if needed. Um, we work in structured cells and we um, we cover all manner of incidents, but our aims are to save life and buy time, gather information, intelligence to help the people that are in crisis. But th the issues that we have are obviously uh, we're we're dealing with immediate threat and immediate risk to life. So often we're we're the last port of call for people or point of contact. So the the incidents that we've got are quite dynamic ordinarily. Uh, and a lot of officers aren't trained to deal with it um, in such a way. So one of my jobs, I'm on the national training team. So we train all negotiators, but also role training out to response officers, call handlers and control room operators to give the right advice and guidance to people that are in crisis. And are for us to be contacted, are thinking about um, ending their life, you know, taking their life. So... Um, what we do is, you know, we, we negotiate with nothing to offer. We offer hope to people that haven't got any and offer life to people that don't want it. I suppose that's how, how we work. So the way that we train people is to communicate effectively, to spend more time listening and getting out of the, the typical police method and actually pay more attention to, to the people that we're dealing with. Listen, don't judge forget you know the, the police robotic response and treat people like they're they're an individual um and i suppose it's focusing on on passion over mission if you like and one of the things that we, we're trying to do is a lot of people that we are dealing with their emotions if this is a seesaw for example if people's emotions are high then their rational thinking and uh, logical thinking is low so by us listening to people and conversing we take the emotion out of it, which means that rational thinking comes in. So that's what we train our officers to do, is to, to try and uh, deal with people, but don't problem solve too early. Don't try and come in with a quick fix at all. It's listen, show empathy, and just li listen to people and don't judge them. So, um, you know, you get you catch more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. So it's teaching people to be nice, to be approachable, be more personable and actually get their personality back and not hide behind the uniform. So emotional intelligence for us is a big key. Tactical empathy, it's been called as well. But when we get the calls uh, through the control room, the officers respond. And if the threat is high, then the negotiating team is contacted. So for me as a coordinator, I'll get the first call. I'll then dispatch one or two of the negotiators to either put the first call in on the telephone or communicate via social media or go face to face. So we've got set timelines to react to that. And obviously different areas around the UK have got different geographical challenges. So I apologize. Uh, so we do have um, a lot of challenges geographically. Um, so we try and be there as quick as we can. But even while we're traveling, we're not driving. We're being driven uh, to people so that we can work out 
and concentrate on, on communicating and saving lives. Um, it's uh, We use a thing called a behavioural change staircase model, which is an old FBI was brought in for negotiators back in the 70s in New York, where we'll talk to people, we concentrate on our active listening skills, we show empathy rather than sympathy. So it's trying to understand uh, what people are going through um, not always agreeing with 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 people, but just saying, "Oh, I can see where you come from. I, under, I understand that from what you've said." So the important things for us is to paraphrase, so use people's words back to them, but also explain in our own words what we think is going on. And by doing that, it shows that we've got an understanding of what people are going through. So we build a rapport. Um, and that's obviously, once you get a bit of a rapport with somebody, you've generally got some kind of shared lived experience. We've all had unfortunate experiences. And I think the thing that we play on or use to our advantage is, is, is if we give a little of ourselves, we generally get a lot back from people. So exposing something about yourself and dropping your guard often uh, gets a very good response and a positive response from people because... You're not hiding behind anything at all. You're showing that you, you've got something wrong with you, which is, is you being a human, isn't it? We then move on to influence and persuasion, which is using Cialdini's principles, um, you know, weapons of influence, they're called. So trying to talk about reciprocity, scarcity, social proof. Lots. Of, it's a, a complicated subject, but it's, it's sales techniques, effectively. It's about selling hope and putting a different uh, angle on things and then once we've got this through and it takes time we then try and influence people's behavior to, to lead to a behavioral change for them coming down and coming to a place of safety but all of this takes a long time and underpinning all of this is trust and that's the one thing once you've lost it you just can't get it back so for us it's never lie be honest, expose a bit of yourself and your background, and then just spend as much time. And a, a thing I do always when I'm face to face with people is I'll take my watch off because in the police, I've got a habit of listening to the radio, looking at my watch, and I don't want anyone to think that I've got anywhere else to be. So when it comes to saving a life, I encourage all of our response officers and negotiators to actually take off your police uniform, you know, your, your reflective jacket, lessen the impact of this, the image and perception that people have got, that we're actually people trying to help. And it, it, it works. My team generally respond in bright blue jackets because we look different from officers in black or bright yellow. We By taking your watch off and actually overtly saying, I take my watch off because I've got a habit of looking at my watch and I don't want you to think there's a time limit or I've got anywhere else to be. Um, you know, and we're just trying to do as much as we can to save people who are in crisis. Um, so a thing that we look at, there's an old, there's a Chinese symbol for listening. And in that symbol, which is thousands of years old, is ears, eyes, your heart, and undivided attention. So that symbol there, is the, the symbol for listening, sums up what we try and do, is be present, undivided attention, be passionate, so your heart there, but look at what's going on, and more importantly, listen to what's going on. And it's something, it's, it's simple, it's there. We listen to understand rather than listen to reply. So it's actually just taking time. And rather than coming up and telling a story about ourselves, it's not about us at all. It's talking to people, uh, showing warmth and competence. Um, and there's a big problem of um, police, I suppose, trying to problem solve because that's the way that we're typically trained is you turn, turn up and people expect you to fix it or you want to fix it. And it's taking that step back and listening to try and understand what the issues are and then being 
a human being about it, you know, and offering support and assistance. Because I think if you can ever lie at the end, you know, if you've saved a life, it's a fantastic thing to do. You know, and I think if that's, if you can just reduce, you know, the police impact and just spend a bit of time with somebody, that could be the most important hour of that person's life. So it's dedicating the time, effort and energy into it. You know, we've got to, with problem solving, you've got to earn the right to try and solve a problem. You don't just go in and you've got to earn it. And you've got to spend time listening to people, summarising things, paraphrasing. And then a big thing for us is mirroring and getting in sync with people. Use their own words. Use people's names. So, you know, there's there's lots of hints and tips or help and advice that we can give. But it's, I suppose, recognise the signs in people around you ask how people are you know so this is just general information so there was a uh, british transport police and the samaritans did something which was small talk saves lives it's take the time to engage with people everybody's so busy but if if you look at the uh, the hashtag small talk saves lives and look on youtube you'll see a series of videos that they produced and they're fantastic because your little interaction could open the door to somebody communicating about how they're feeling. Ask specifically about suicide and state the impression, you know, from what you've said, this is what I'm thinking. Stay with people, learn about mental first aid, keep people safe. And as Eleanor said, remove harmful items, remove things that are in people's plans. Acknowledge that people's feelings are legitimate. Um, repeat their words back to them. So paraphrasing, this shows your understanding, showing empathy rather than sympathy and encouraging people to get through, take small steps, get through today. Don't think about everything. It's get through today and take one day at a time, one thing at a time. Identify hooks and levers. So things that are really important to people, the, the things that they value and hold dear to them. And don't make people feel guilty about the feelings of others. And, you know, people have got to feel important. They've got to be listened to, valued and understood. That's what people need in their life. Offer support and hope. And then don't minimise the problems or compare people to others. Everybody's an individual. Deal with them as an individual. And then, as Anna said, you've got this... A safety plan and Simon said as well, the, you've got the wraps, the safety plans, a crisis plan. Help somebody build that plan. It shows that you're engaged. Go to appointments with them, offer support. And then once the, everything's de-escalated, but always follow up. We promise people the world and you used to be encouraged to disengage. But now we do follow up calls for people just to make sure that, that they are right and they're getting the help that they need. So ask twice is is it. So that's that's us, you know, as the police. I know there's there's some questions in the chat that I'd seen, but I was trying to concentrate on this about the police's current role in mental health uh, incidents. I'm sure I can be fielded some questions, but thank you, Simon. That's great, Ash. Thank you so much. That's a really positive comment there as well. Really intrigued by your, your skill set, Ash, and your, the different approaches you've taken. Um, I guess one of the things that is quite common is a question for myself, but a lot of people, when they're experiencing acute suicidal thoughts, feel a lot of shame and they don't feel kind of worthy and they don't want to be a burden as well. That's really important. And calling 999 feels that you're, especially a lot of stigma around using public services at the moment. How do you feel when you get that call? Is that do you feel your job is a, it's like you were no, like frustrated by them, or do you feel it's a like a privilege doing this job? Is it something that gives you kind of job satisfaction? Well, I, I think it's you know everybody on my team are, are volunteers, and to be called to save somebody's life is an absolute. It's a privilege to to be in that position. It's an unfortunate one that somebody's been put in that situation. But for us to help people offer support and be there and 
the successes that we get, but it's also it's that linking in with people and and we're not just a uniform, it's not just 999. It's when people's lives are at risk, our job is generally to save lives. And our team are all highly trained and we're on call all the time. And you know, we get calls to all manner of things and it's not it's never a burden for me personally and nobody on my team it's it's that people are in crisis and they need help and we're the help that's there to, and we can refer people so you know with the right care right person that can come down the line but if if life is at risk and we can help then that's what we do thanks ash um some of the questions are about the the new police reforms and understand that your role hasn't changed as such that because it's they haven't but we were just clarifying that and also what the um the role of the police in the sectioning uh, in sectioning as well and the role of paramedics because it's certainly something i'm not an expert on by any means at all i know it's very common for the police to have to get involved but um just understanding what what role the police have in that area if you if that's part of the the police's big 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 force so that might not be your expertise but soon you'll know a lot more about it than i do so yeah, I, th I think um, there's an, an increase in calls um, to the to the police for mental health crisis, but the new act, I, I think you can look at it from from two ways. But the way I've looked at it is that rather than untrained police officers going to a to a call, we call on specialists. There's more for partners to do. Uh, and, and working together, which we work very closely with our mental health services where where I work, and we know them, they know us, and we're we're just trying to work together, you know, because we can if if we've got people with them, and we're just trying to organise something with one of our local groups is to have them readily available to be not just on the phone, but come to some incidents with us. So you can actually see somebody that's there. So we're not all talk. There's actually people that can offer support because uh, a lot of people that we deal with are known to local services. Uh, and if they're not known to local, they could be in national services, but they'll they'll be able to obtain that information and, and get the information. But it's we're all there to care for people. So sometimes, you know, we get involved in, in the sectioning process but again, the roles are changing and the police, um, we're taking a step back in a lot of them because there's, there's more organisation, um, but we're always there. So, you know, and it's just police stations of place of safety, things have changed for custody suites about um, them being places of safety because, you know, I think anybody that's been in a police cell, it's a... You know, it's not a comfortable environment. It's not the right place to be for somebody who's suffering. You know, and it's it's recognizing that fact. So your service hasn't changed at all because it's. I know that they're not they're not responding to all mental health um, issues or events. I don't know the terminology that they've used on it exactly, but but in terms of if life is at risk, which are, which obviously suicidal thoughts are that. The police are still going to get involved and that's still your team is still going to be able to do those do those calls yeah yeah and you know we we get lots and lots of calls and we we deal with them all you know it's um i think for our team especially but with the change in the the procedures and the, and the policy some of the calls we wouldn't even be aware of so police officers if it comes into a combined control room it'll be dispatched to an appropriate agency before officers on the street even know that there was a call because mm -hmm. at the earliest opportunity it's being referred across but when we get calls to life at risk you know high risk missing people you've got people in crisis there's you know and it's it's just going there it's being present but it's an early engagement with people so as quick as we can but rather than rush in we do our research first so we've done some preparation we've looked at intelligence systems we've got try and get as much information as we can before we engage but you know just to to give us an advantage but not use it to solve problems it's you know it proves our competence really 
if we know a bit about somebody or about the issues that, that, that they're experiencing. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ash. This might be a question for Eleanor as well. Um, Jenny, I think I've got your question right. Apologies if, I, if I'm misreading it, but how do you how do you encourage someone who's a kind of a, a reluctant individual who's having suicidal thoughts, but doesn't kind of uh, saying that they feel like killing themselves, but just kind of give, giving them, helping them on the way to seeking help or trying to convince them that they do need to have help. It's a tricky one, isn't it? Um, sorry, this is someone that won't engage at all with... I won't someone speak. won't engage. I think that's my interpretation of it. Jenny, if I'm wrong on that, just retype the question and again, apologies. Um, um, wasn't it? Oh. Yeah, I think that if someone's not ready to engage, but they're really, really ill, then obviously, if they're under a psychiatrist, speak to your psychiatrist about that. If they're not under psychiatry, try as much as you can to get them referred. Um, if it's an emergency and you really need support, but you, the main thing is if someone isn't going to engage, it's very, very challenging because to actually get them to get help, to get help in that sense, um, if it's not an emergency. So I'm not really sure what I would recommend. It's obviously you can be as caring as possible and, you know, try and keep them as safe as possible and speak to doctors and things like that. But if they're not ready to engage and don't want to, it's very difficult to actually, that's my experience anyway, to actually kind of get them to seek help. Mm -hmm. That's probably not what you want to hear, I imagine, but I think that's the reality. Yeah. I guess it's like, Yash, anything to add on that at all? No, no, I mean, um, exactly what, what Anna said, sorry, computer issues as well, I do apologise. Yeah, it's, um, I guess, it could, doing the comparison with cardiovascular, isn't it? I mean, it's sometimes understanding um, that, that there's things you can do to reduce the risk, but also that um, those feelings will pass as well. The, there's a very it's a, unfortunately it's a natural part of bipolar and a lot of people talk about how the, it's kind of be able to differentiate between themselves and the bipolar talking as well because sometimes those thoughts as you say can be very intrusive Eleanor um, so they can help so I know um, Philip's just posted there about um, his own experiences and it does sound like it's a very common side effect of bipolar it's particularly type 2 bipolar which has a lot more of the kind of deep recurring suicidal thoughts is part of it um, but talking about suicide doesn't it, it, it doesn't cause suicide it um, it reduces the risk of it so um, in that respect Philip and I know that I think one of them I think Molly will be responding on that if you want to talk to one of our team please do so and talk to your psychiatrist and GP as well because there's help that, that, that you can get for that as well um, as Eleanor said a lot of medication can be very effective I'm not a psychiatrist I can't prescribe anything the CINI, the data that we see is that lithium can be very effective for, for an old man who didn't, for, for suicide reduction. Um, and that's a generic treatment as well. It's um, it's something that's um, naturally occurring substance. Obviously got side effects. You wouldn't want anyone to take lithium unless they had to take it. Uh, but with the blood test that they do now, it's um, it's a lot safer than what it was um, 30, 30 years ago or more. Um, so it's, um, certainly talk to your doctor. That might be, there might be something that can be helped with your medication. Um, but it's a, I mean, living with bipolar is just really tough. It's you have to be an Olympic athlete just to live a normal day, essentially, for want of a better term. Um, you have to try lots of different things to be able to keep yourself well and like having enough sleep, exercise, making sure you've got a proper, like, balanced diet, keeping close to family, having a sense of purpose. Um, what I think is a really positive development is around survivor research as well, which is something that we're really proud of in, in Push as a charity, which is. And I guess, Eleanor, you, you, you're kind of part of that, which is um, people have, the, the experts in bipolar are the people living with bipolar and the people who've had those those um, suicidal thoughts and survived them. Like that's, like people with bipolar have got uh, remarkable resilience and they've built up lots of different techniques and approaches that have helped keep themselves during those, that keep themselves safe during those moments of acute um, suicidal thoughts. So um, there's a really good blog on our website written by one of our community about a toolkit, suicidal toolkit. And talking to them, one of the things I was, it was really good advice was um, he thought about his suicidal thoughts when he had been really depressed. And he then thought about all the things he's done with his life since that moment when he um, was, was contemplating taking his own life. And he thought that all of those things would never have happened. 
And that's he, and when he has those thoughts again, he will go back to that thought and think, well, actually, there's going to be a huge amount that I've been able to do in my life, which I would never have done if I'd uh, lost my life then. So I think it's um, building up a lot of those techniques and be able to train your mind as well, because a lot of the a lot of um, bipolar symptoms are about rumination um, and trying to get yourself out of that frame of mind. There might be like suicidal thoughts and depression, especially bipolar, are very, are very complex because you're you're also interacting with very real um, life events as well. It's not that the depressive episodes are just just come out of nowhere. Like a lot of people with bipolar are also carrying a huge amount of trauma. They'll be often experiencing lots of financial um, challenges as well. I think one of the comments earlier on was around employment. A lot of people with bipolar are less likely to to be in work and to to be earning and so forth. So it's um, a lot of things that might keep people awake at night anyway. People with bipolar have that several times over and then they're having to live with the condition itself. So it's um, it's a whole, you need to take a whole person approach and, and to really plan your life around it and how to prevent, how to try to reduce the risk of these feelings. And then also just not feeling guilty when they do occur. That's a really big thing as well because we know lots of people with bipolar. They will do absolutely everything right. They will have followed every word that we've been talking about today and things will still go wrong. That's just the part of life, unfortunately. Uh, but if then that's the case and things do go wrong, then just call 999. I think that's the crucial piece of advice you take from this is that your life is worth, is a life as an end in itself and there's someone there that wants to save it. Um, and there's someone like Ash who will be able to pick up the call and will be able to, to be able to come around and to be able to help you get through that moment. Do we have any other questions at all? Um, oh, Molly. Hello. Molly, you've joined us again. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, all three of you, for talking and for sharing so much. I know it can be difficult to talk about those types of topics, so it's really, really important for us to be able to hear people with that experience share it. Um, just as a reminder for everyone in the chat, if we'll go through, we have 10 minutes until we finish. So I've got a few questions, but if at any point we don't answer your question in particular, please do reach out to us. I'll put this email address in the chat, but it's info at bipolaruk.org and it will enable you to connect to someone one-to-one -one and to either have your question answered via email or over the telephone with a member of the team. Um, because I can see I've been reading through, obviously, as everyone's been talking, and some of them are quite personal. Um, and so we'd be more than happy to have a conversation with you directly and to answer those questions, whether they be about bipolar, about the things we talked about today, about what we've talked about in previous webinars. Just give us a shout and let us know. Um, the first question that we have um, that came up in the chat, and thank you again, everyone, for asking those questions, both privately and in the general chat, um, is about how you look after yourself as a loved one of someone who is feeling suicidal. So we talked a lot about how you might cope yourself, um, how you might talk to someone about it. But one of the questions was, how do you look after yourself when someone you care about tells you they're feeling, feeling suicidal? Um, there were conversations about navigating burnout and feelings of failure as a loved one. So I don't know if anyone wants to, to start that off. Feel free to unmute yourself and go for it. Um, yeah, I think it, I think it's very painful when you hear, you know, that if someone is suicidal, but the most important thing is just kind of, as Ash said, be there as like a listening ear. Um, if it's too much for you and it's triggering your own stuff, then be really careful, like about how deep a conversation you get into about things, um, and see if there's someone else that can support you alongside kind of with the other person. But you also have to remember that them feeling suicidal is not about you and you shouldn't sort of personalize it in that sense it's not anything you've done you're there just to listen um as calmly as you can and then seek help and support if you need it that's what i would say thank you thank you very much that's really really helpful i don't know ashley as a professional if you have any tips for navigating that kind of burnout that you might feel if somebody's talking to you about it a lot because i'm sure it will still apply uh, for someone who's taking care of someone who's quite poorly yeah i mean i've actually dealt with a few incidents where it's the crisis has been from the person who's looking after it. they've taken a burden or they they think that they they try to fix everything and they've basically just got an overload themselves so they're 
facing a crisis and it's exactly the same is we listen don't judge if you think of what that person's tried to do for somebody else it's recognizing how caring that person is how important they are and again listen to valued and understood and if if you i think we'll have it i've done it a few times and just explain to them how important they are it gives you that pat on the back and it makes you feel valued it makes you realize how important you are and as much as people say that doesn't it, it's not important to them everybody likes a pat on the back everybody wants to feel like somebody's got their arm around them and you're going through it together but i think sharing sharing that burden and actually just offloading it often to somebody that you don't know is really helpful because they don't know you at all it's just and it's it's something that we we deal with a, a lot and it's again it's a privilege for people to trust us enough to tell us their innermost thoughts and their worries and concerns but if it helps them then then that's what our job is to do but it's more than a job i think for me it's it's a it's a vocation isn't it it's, you, th you think if you're in a privileged position to save people's lives then i, th I don't know any any work role that's that satisfying to be honest Thank you. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, we talked a lot about those kind of acute feelings of suicide, what you do if you need urgent help and support and building a plan around those feelings. But do any of you have any tips on managing or coping with suicidal feelings that last a long time? Um, so they might be like an undercurrent to your day to day, or you might be feeling them regularly for a significant period of time. Um, so it's actually quite a difficult question because I think when when it's going on for a long time it's actually quite difficult to manage so um, I think the most important thing is is sharing about how you're feeling speaking to family or a trusted it should be someone you trust if you don't trust family I say speak to a trusted friend um, about how you're feeling um, it could be something like writing out your thoughts, um, so journaling about how you're feeling. Um, although if this fights them, obviously don't do that like every single day. <laughs> Just do it, you know, when you feel comfortable. There's various distraction techniques as well that people employ when they have suicidal thinking. Um, if it's an undercurrent, um, so it could be thinking about getting through the next hour, the next half an hour, little activities you can do to distract yourself. But ultimately, it can be very, very distressing. So. Ash, I don't know if you have any kind of if you come, you know, work with people who um regularly have kind of suicidal thoughts that you go out and see. Um yeah. yeah so. I, I, I think um people that, that I deal with regularly, we get a lot of repeat callers. I think it's it's about three percent nationwide of people that call nine 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 for assistance. And we were, you know, we maintain a database of everybody that we've spoken to things that have worked experiences they've had so that the next negotiator in the uk can access this database and look at who spoke to them before and what they were going through it shows that rather than start at the bottom we've actually got some information and, and intelligence about the people but you know i think at managing suicidal thoughts a lot of people that i deal with talk about doing fitness some people read a book listen to music, go somewhere, but avoid, they also avoid certain things because of what it can do to their mood. So uh, we work quite closely. I think the thing that helps us is those follow-up calls. Not everybody does it, but just somebody who's in crisis and I've promised them the world, just a follow-up call, one or two sleeps later, just checking in. People will say, oh, when you said this, I did this. And try and find out what it was that made people change their mind. We can pass on to other officers and other staff members, but also other people, just to share share the learning and share things like that. But I do find, as Eleanor said, there's a lot of people that talk about distractions and journaling can be really helpful because you write your thoughts. And it's if there's no one there, it's venting. But I think a lot of times, speak to someone you know have people around you because uh, I think positivity is infectious, isn't it? If you're around positive people, 
you do that but if you're, you're alone or isolated with your thoughts then you need to try and contact professionals contact family members friends or if as simon said if it's it's an immediate risk then phone 999 that's what we're here for Thank you. Um, and the last question, squeeze one last question in. We talked a lot about how important it is to talk to professionals, but I know when we were planning this session, we had a conversation about how hard that can be to do, um, particularly if you're not feeling very well. So um, a few people asked about speaking to GPs or other professionals about suicide and whether or not there are any ways to help them stay safe or look after themselves or feel confident when talking to a professional about the way that they've been feeling. Um, <laughs> I think other people watching this that have bipolar may experience lack of trust with professionals at times. Um, so it can be very challenging to reach out and go, okay, I need to speak to somebody if you've had a bad experience or you're nervous. But I have found that there are very good professionals and there are GPs that are well-trained in mental health. Equally, there are, are there are some that are not as well-trained. So it's a bit of a lottery as to who you'll get. But I, but I think you know, they're there to help you, they've trained to help you. And if you're able to explain as best as you can what's going on, then hopefully they'll they'll give you that support. Um but it can be it can be really hard to reach for that help from professionals, um, particularly as you move into hospital care, I think. But um GPs generally are kind of I found them anyway to be quite helpful. Um but it depends on the person, I think. Um, just to add on that, it's um, one of the challenges for people living with bipolar is a fluctuating condition as well. So people will go to the GP for support, and obviously, if there's a delay to getting through, they might they, those feelings might have passed. Um, but they still need the help. So it's uh, and people wouldn't necessarily raise suicidal thoughts when they're starting to feel better if they go to a GP. And there's lots of reasons for that, like contextualized memory that people can only remember the mood state, previous mood states they were in at that time. Um, but if you, we've got a mood tracker app, which we're, you can use to track your moods and we, you can use the mood scale from 0 to 10. So you can look at your mood and that helps people to, to contextualize where they're, where they're at. So you can see that in the past you've been de like depressed and you could record the things that kind of maybe cheered you up, brought you into a higher mood state. That can be really effective because um, it'll start to almost like train yourself a little bit. Um, but also, we I mean, we're on the functionality we want to be able to add is for you to be able to to download it and then to be able to take it to your GP and then you could have a printout or take it to your psychiatrist. Ultimately, we want everyone to have a psychiatrist so that could they can just share with it online. Uh, but a bit of a way of that. But do have a look at our mood tracker app. It's developed by someone with lived experience who's um, who did it all, all entirely for free. So it's uh, something that's been created by our community. Um, but never lose hope. I mean, there's loads of people with bipolar leading really amazing lives who have uh, battled depression, battled suicidal thoughts, and um, have, have built techniques and approaches to living well with the condition. And like Alan does on the call now, and if those things aren't working, absolutely no shame. Like um, keep going and talk to someone like Ash. I mean, people want to save your life, and there's in, in time you might be saving other people's as well. So we're all in it together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all of you for joining us today. Thank you, Eleanor, Simon and Ashley for sharing so much important information. As we said, um, you will get an email after this once the recording is ready with the recording of today's session and a little bit of follow up information. But if any of you have any questions, please reach out to info at bipolaruk.org and we'd be happy to talk. We'd be happy to answer your questions and perhaps build some of those plans that we've talked about and share our experiences some more. Um, we do have another webinar upcoming on bipolar and sleep, which we will send to you in the email after today's session. But thank you again. Please do look after yourself, stay safe and reach out if there's anything we can do to help. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you so thank much. You for joining us. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you.